before we start, I really want to do something, since this is the, the biggest room I ever was. I want to hear the sound. The phantom of the opal is there inside my heart. Cool, so it sounds nice. Good. I really wanted to do that, to be in a, in, a, in, a, in a hall equally bigger than our opera back home. Good, so the art of clean code. Uh, really, really excited to be here with you to talk to you about my favorite topic. Who am I, first of all? I'm Victor Enta, a consultant, a technical lead, one of the lead architects for the largest, one of the largest clients of IBM Romania. But that's not me, actually. I'm a clean code evangelist. And I talked about clean code and clean architecture in all these conferences, and I keep talking about that because this is what I love to do. With my free time, however, my passion is basically to train and to teach and coach others. So I already have some experience with that. So that's why I'm here with you today from this passion. I talked about, I teach Spring, Java, Enterprise, Clean Code, Architectures, even in faculty, I teach design patterns, coding dojos, performance, and many more. Okay, enough about me. What will we talk today about? First of all, why am I here? What is this clean code stuff and why do we need it? Then the names, or better yet, the power invested in tips. Then the, about the single responsibility principle, a principle which many might say that it's the most important principle of programming. Then about the utopia we've been learning about. Then about, about incompetence. Then some how to handle this lightsaber that we were given by Java 8, right? How do we write clean code with Java 8 if we have enough time to cover? Okay, clean code does one thing well, says the inventor of C++, right? You can already see the single responsibility principle in there. Clean code reads like well-written prose, like a book. You can see that the author of, a, of, of clean code really put his best effort into writing expressive, nice, elegant code, beautiful code. Clean code is when each method you read turns out to be pretty much what you've expected in the context you, you have found it. And Monty Farrer comes and says that anyone can write code that a computer can understand, right? MOV, AX, BX. But few, few programmers are able to write code that a human can understand. And that's what we're here today, to talk about how to communicate uh, uh, instead of coding. Okay. This, pretty, this is pretty interesting. The code that you read needs to turn out to be pretty much what you've already expected in the context you found it. Uh, before we can move on, do you know the international unit of measuring for code quality? Yes, that's it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it out loud, but it's the number of times the, uh, uh, the developers scream and, uh, and curse when they review the code. Right? And this is actually the, the essence of the principle of least astonishment. You don't want the code to shock you at each step. You want your code to work with you, to be familiar, to be easy to read and understand. Why do we need clean code? It's pretty easy. You all know probably that the true cost of software relies on its maintenance, not in its initial development. 80% goes there. Why? Why so much? Because we get slower and slower as time passes by. A task that you do now, in five minutes, you will do in one month, in one hour, and in two years, it might even become impossible. So we get slower and slower because the code quality degrades. You may not be concerned of these financial considerations, but the fact that you turn out to read code 10 times more than you get to write code, it should tell you something. You should do your very best to write good code, even if that means it, writing becomes quite hard. So a rule that you can, uh, an idea that you can follow uh, in this spirit is that whenever you take code off Git to write some change requests, to fix some, something, don't limit yourself to that fixing that thing. Also, do some random acts of kindness, some little improvements to the code, some extract methods, some extract variables, some renaming, to help you to, to, make, to, to keep the code alive. Otherwise, you'll come to work in a place like this, dominated by fear. You'll come to work, you'll sit on the chair, and suddenly you will feel terrified by changing the code, right? You don't want to, to, go, to come to work to such a place, right? Actually, it is said that the day in which you stop refactoring, it is the day that your application has become legacy, and you all want to work in legacy code, don't you, right? So avoid that. The point is, if you continue to postpone a certain refactoring once, twice, in the end it will become harder and harder to do that refactoring, and you will end up not doing it. So don't be afraid to refactor. Always when you have the idea, go ahead, refactor it. Otherwise, you will have legacy code quite soon. Now, 
A lot of us, of developers, are, me also, are, are fascinated by this power that we have. At work, we literally can invent things, can put them in code, give them names, and make them alive. Very few professions are able to, to run the thing that they created, right? To, to give life in a sense. So this is a huge responsibility because we have to invent new things. We have to select names for these things. And as you all know, with great power comes great responsibility, right? So you have to be good at picking up good names for the things that you create. I'm talking about writing prose here. Of course, a function should not sound like that, right? What does the transaction function do? Does it save, create, persist? What does it do? You should have, obviously, some verbs in them, right? Now, with Boolean things, uh, you should, the very name of that thing, which is of type Boolean, should scream at you that it's a Boolean there. You can't possibly answer with 17 with, to such a question, right? These are predicates. These are names that scream to you that this is true or false. Now, uh, for class names, it's pretty straightforward. They are nouns, of course. They are the things that we work with. But when you select names for your classes, try to avoid adding these useless prefixes or suffixes like this. Tell me, what is the difference just by looking at the class name? What's the difference between order info and order? Let me, let me take my shot. Order info has fields, right? Duh, it's a class. It can have fields, so this is like refusing your power. This is just like not willing to take up the responsibility and putting a good name. There is one guy who said on Twitter that he searched for a class name for four hours. Four hours for a class name. I don't say tomorrow you should put your Jira task searching for a class name for four hours, but the point is that by the end of those four hours, that developer clarified his entire domain by looking at the connotations, the possible meanings, the related concepts of that thing that he searched for. So take the time to find good names for the classes that you create. In the same spirit, if you encounter a thing named iCustomerService, tell me, what is this? It's, it's an interface. Of it. And it, there is also a class named Customer Service which implements this. Quite, quite obvious. The same applies for this naming convention. This is just stupid, actually. This is just stupid, and I will tell you, delete your interfaces. Fully remove them, with three exceptions. In case you really send your interfaces to your remote clients for remote invocations, or if you are using really this strategy pattern and you are selecting the implementation to use dynamically based on some data, or in case you are doing dependency inversion, like I've discussed in the morning in the, in the clean architecture talk. Cool. Now, tell me, honestly, how do you understand a function? You see a function, you want to use it. How do you do? What do you do? You probably would read the comment that it's there, right? And then probably you will start hunting for the other places in which that function is being called, and you will invoke in a similar way the same function, right? The most Spartans of you will probably open up the implementation of the function, and they will start reading code and reverse engineer the function. This is tremendous effort, and you shouldn't need to do that each time. The name of the function should tell you all that is about it, its intention. That's why, whenever you think you found a better name, go ahead and refactor. But at times, there is this thought that occurs to you, oh my god, it's impossible. I couldn't have found a better name that was chosen by the elders who wrote the application 15 years ago, right? This is complete nonsense. You should. Find better names as you learn the application. So go ahead and rename it. Rename it on the spot. The IDEs will help you a lot. It's trivial stuff with a decent IDE, and it really fails. This renaming, it's usually it goes OK. The only places where it might fail if you have reflection going on in your application, or if you have some XMLs that reference some class names. But you will find out which classes are more fragile, and you will take care next time. This even has a name. It's named comprehension refactoring. It's something like, ah, look what I found. Let me rephrase the code in order for the, for the following developer to be easier to understand. I'm talking about the continuous renaming process as you learn the application, because there are no perfect names. You know this quote, I repeat myself from, from the morning, but there are only two things hard in programming, cache and validation and naming things. And I'm talking about finding good names here. The whole team will be grateful. Yourself will be grateful in three months. Tell me one thing, honestly. How many of you have cursed the code, some code, and then found out that they were the author of that code? Right? You read on, and then you see, oh my god, it was me. 
Why, why does this happen? Probably you didn't review your code back then enough. But more importantly, you forget the design decisions. You forget the code that you write. Weekend, you already don't remember all the decisions or the micro design that you put in place. So yourself will be grateful for that. I'm talking about a continuous renaming, a continuous refining of the name, just like a distillery, for example. Now, uh, the names, of course, should be pronounceable. How could you argue with someone about this function? It's, it's a complete nonsense, so use words, right? Um, I'm talking about avoiding abbreviations, not inventing new abbreviations every five minutes. Of course, don't be smart and write value-added text in your code. Write VAT, of course. It's a, it's a, it's a well-known business term that you should embrace and use in your code. But I'm talking about not inventing new abbreviations each time, because they have to be learned. Names should be consistent. If you go to database with find, fetch, or get, I don't, I don't mind. The only thing that I mind is that always to use the same verb when you fetch something from the database. Enforce conventions and have your developers to follow them. Why? Because the code will look familiar to you, even if it's not you who wrote it. All developers should follow the same naming conventions. Now, when selecting a name, don't, uh, don't refer to a customer with buyer and client in different places, because the reader will get confused. Why the heck? What's the difference? Why is it buyer there and customer here? There is no reason. The author was just being overly creative. He should have, wrote, he, he, he should have written poetry instead, not code. In code, you want to be exact, precise, concise. Don't leave room, don't leave any ambiguity. You know, this gap, right? On the one side, there's the business with the money, and on the other side, it's us with the bytes. And we need to exchange our bytes with their money. So the first thing we need to build is a bridge between us. So learn their domain always, and have also them to understand the limitations of our world that you cannot possibly have to submit buttons on the same page, for Christ's sake. Explain them these things, make them understand. So both of you should learn something from the other one, um, other one's world. Now, with functions, it's pretty straightforward. It's all about the single responsibility principle. A function should do one thing, it should do it well, and it should do it only, says Uncle Bob. For that purpose, a function should be small. How small should a function be? Tell me. Five lines, that's what the Bible says, five lines. Five lines of code, oh my God. Oh my God, the first time that I've read that, I was like, what the heck? How come five lines, it's impossible? Why so small? Well, you can't possibly do many things in five lines of code, right? If you do a try-catch, you're done. You have try-catch and you have two more lines. What would you do in those two lines? You will, you will call other functions, of course. You will invoke other functions. So the thing is, in five lines of code, you can't possibly write much of a logic, much of many things. So you have a better chance of, having a of finding a good name for that, for that function. Interesting enough. However, this five is just empirical, right? In our applications, we, we often have this boilerplate code going on, get set, get set, get set. It doesn't make sense to have five lines of code per method with such code. The heuristic that I use personally is that if a function it takes me more than three seconds to understand, I break it up. Right? Just if it's too much logic in it, if it's fifth for complicated things, I break it up in smaller methods. So the idea is that the function should never exceed even so one screen. And I don't mean you should rotate your monitor. Right? One screen means, I don't know, 25 lines, if it's boilerplate stupid code. Cool. Now, if you don't, you will end up with such a function like I did years ago, deliberately prohibiting myself of any kind of refactoring. And then if, uh, uh, now, at the end of the day, for me, it was very easy to work with this function because I just wrote it. I knew all its shapes, you know? It, for me, it was perfect. I mean, it was super familiar. I oriented very well in it by just following the indentations and the fours, the ifs that I knew were there. However, for the rest of the team, this is like complete wilderness, just as like, like a completely unknown landscape. Now, honestly, what would you do if I would give you to, to, to implement a change request in such a function? First of all, you are working with me in the team, so probably you will start reading from the beginning to make sure you don't do any, something stupid, and you will read, 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 and at some point, the, uh, the, the phone rings. It's the mother, okay? The cat is sick. Oh, my God. Okay. 
Then you keep reading, 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 and there comes the lunch break. What do you do? You go for the lunch, of course. You know, the pyramid of needs. We have to feed first, you know? And then you come back from the lunch. You don't recall exactly what was there above, but you keep reading, reading. And at some point, you say, Eureka, I found it. Here, I need to do something else, something additional. What do you do now? What? You put a? Huh? You put an if. Yes, you put an if, and you add the book parameter there above, right? It's perfect. It's like walking in the, on the street with a, dirt, with a used tissue in the hand, and you find a trash bin that overflows. What do you do with, with, the, with, the, with the tissue? You put it there, since it's already there, right? You just added one more responsibility to the same function. What you, what you should have done is to break it up into smaller functions. Little ones, extract them all, end up with 25 functions, like I did and then be terrified. Why was I terrified when I ended up with, with 25 functions? Please don't tell me performance, because smaller methods were proven to work faster because, of, because they get hot faster and get compiled to native code faster. So no, the performance is not the problem. With performance, there is just one down. The, with performance, there is just one single rule to follow. Measure, don't guess, like Kirk Pepperdine said. Actually, Premature optimization is the root of all evil, to clutter your code up front just because you think you might have a performance problem, don't. Don't do that. Measure the problem and then clutter your code with optimizations by always looking at the gain in milliseconds that you achieved using by, 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 by breaking, by making your code ugly. So no, it wasn't performance that scared me. But it was the fact that instead of having one single familiar function, I now had 25 functions to remember. Come on. I had, I had 25 functions to remember. I was juggling with 25 new functions. Well, by the end of the day, I didn't even recall the names of those 25 functions. For me, the author, it was very hard to work with so many names, but for, all the, for, for the entire team, things were a lot clearer, because the function, the names that I've put to those new functions were looking like this. Let me read one for you. Remove all past canceled orders of consumer. With all due respect, if you can't understand what this function does, I don't want to work with you. So you have to be brain dead simple for the reader to understand, because you might be debugging this function Friday evening at 12 o'clock at night. So be kind to your readers, leave behind you long names that tell what the function is doing. And since we're talking about saying responsibility principle, let's look at this example. This is a function that receives two booleans, right, like before. Uh, how many things do you think this function can do at, at maximum? Well, at least four, right? I mean, true, false, 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 true. So break it up. Break it up and, uh, in many, many, many methods, and then combine the invocations to these methods to achieve what you want. Now, this particular kind of function means not only laziness or fear, but mean also rush. And more importantly, this function tells us two things. First of all, the team is terrified by refactoring this function, is scared to touch this function. And also, this function was recently changed. A Boolean parameter was added. It means that the function is ugly, I mean, scares the developers, and changes. It is the perfect candidate to start refactoring with, because it's the maximum gain you can bring. It, it changes, and it annoys people. So refactor this one. In the same spirit, if you ever Take, accept customer to be null, you will also do a null check, right? You will test if customer different than null, then you continue. And again, you are doing two things, what for null and what for not null. So I'll tell you, don't accept nullable parameters. Oh my God, what am I telling you? I'm telling you, then the question is, when, when and where do you fight with invalid data? Okay, this brings us to the null wars. Let's suppose you can build a fortress inside your code. You can put some kind of code inside the fortress and the rest of the code and data has to be outside. Inside the fortress, I would personally want to have my domain services, the, the essential business logic of my application, in a safe, green, peaceful, zen place. I want to have my logic there and, 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 and uh, let all the corrupt data that surrounds me outside the walls. 
So leave all the data out. Then, at the entry point in your, in your fortress, you, do, you put a bodyguard, a strong bodyguard, which does defensive programming, thoroughly checks every kind of data that wants to enter the fortress. If you do that, you can gain a sense of confidence, of trust. You no longer have to check any kind of data for invalid data, for negative age, for uh, empty name. Uh, so do this at the, at the entry point in your system and then trust the data you have inside. However, at some point, you might end up with a null inside your fortress. And this null might actually have a business meaning. Like, for example, the fact that the customer doesn't have a gold card, it uh, might be business-wise reasonable, right? If it makes sense in a business mindset, then you could run an optional. And I keep saying that optional is the best, the best underused feature of Java 8. So wrap it in an optional and work with the optional. Don't pass the null around. But if the null actually represents a fatal condition, don't be afraid of throwing an exception. End the flow on the spot with no fuss. And this brings us to exceptions. You know, there, there was a war between runtime and checked exception. The war is over, long over, because you don't want to do this. Right? And this particular example will have me, will schedule 15 minutes of personal discussion with you. I mean, if you do that ever, you know, swallow exceptions. It's absolutely horrible. So in order not to be forced to do this, always prefer to uh, throw and, and uh, handle runtime exceptions because we don't see those runtime exceptions. Now, just my preferences now, I always have a global exception handler at, the, at any thread entry point in my system. Because not only HTTP threads play in your application, but there are also, I don't know, file pollers, timers, GMS messages coming to your application. Make sure that anywhere a thread enters your application, you have this try catch in place to log the exception nice in the, in, in the log. Then if you have to have nice message uh, translated in the, in, the, in, the, in the language of the user, put some code inside your exception and then translate it outside using some message source, blah, blah. Now, if you do that, um, and uh, there is one more thing here, um, avoid catches. Avoid writing catch in your business logic code. How can you do that? Uh, actually, the most, the vast majority of, your, of the exceptions that occur are fatal conditions. There are only a few exceptions that you can retry. For example, HTTP connection timeout or something like that. You could imagine a retry mechanism. For the rest of the cases, exceptions are usually fatal conditions. So don't be afraid to throw them here and leave them propagate down to the exception handler at the end. So in, in short, don't do in your code. Don't, don't use catch. So minimize uh, as much as possible. There are quite a bunch of, of principles and guidelines to follow, quite a few. And it's pr practically impossible to write these kind of functions without continuous refactor. It's impossible to write these functions from scratch. Absolutely impossible. The only way to do it is by continuously refactoring the code once you have it working. So you are not done when the code star first starts working. And I look at my colleagues, my junior colleagues, what do they do? If they always get up and run to take a break after they finish some use case, then at the next project, probably that guy won't be in my team. But if I see him every once in a while, maybe reflecting a bit and thinking of better ways to expressing the design that he just did, then I love him. I like him. The point here is that the best moment to refactor the code that you've just written, it is after you see it working. It is then when you should clean up your code. It is, this is this way how you can grow your design. One smart guy says that uh, the time that you see your code first start working, it is the moment in which you start investing in your career, in which you start building your own design skills. Because we all screw the design up the first time we, we do it. Let's, let's, let's admit, some of us have remorses, have this bad feeling about what they just did. But if you feel this, this remorse, don't get, get up and, and run. Stay for five more minutes and refactor the code that you just wrote. In, in your head, there are all the micro decisions, all the, the remorses, all the traders that you, that you just did. It's the best time to refactor. Not tomorrow, not after lunch break, then on the spot. Whew. Now, code example, finally. How can you simplify this bit of code, this huge code? Uh, well, first of all, you see, if the reader gets past the if, 
he automatically gets tired because he has to remember that an else will follow. Then he enters another if with another else, then a four, then a try, catch. Then, you know, and when, it, when he reaches finally the actual business logic, he's like this, I mean, what the heck? He has to remember so much. It turns out actually that the number of consecutive tabs indentations that you have in a function is a good measure of the complexity of the function. You can, oh, by the way, uh, you, you, can, you can refactor, you can, like this, let me, animation. Huh? You can refactor this by reordering the test. So first check the parameter. If something is wrong, ab abruptly exit the method or the early return refactor, actually. And if, all, if in, and if all is well, then continue on. Now, you can see the number of consecutive tabs is just one, right? And it's actually a good measure, I told you. And I actually had a client that had a Maven plugin set up that in case it detected any three consecutive tabs, it will fail the build. I mean, wow. Wow. Because let's admit it, all the, the nastiest function we ever saw were deeply nested. If you see a function with just just like a papyrus, down, 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 without any indentation, you can easily probably cut it into multiple pieces without fuss, without many, many complications. But if it's super deeply nested, it's, it, it, it's a mess. Now, that's the most simple refactor we can ever imagine. Now, let's talk about the most complicated factor. IntelliJ actually offers it out of the box for you, but let's, let, let, me, um, let me dissect it a bit. Now, uh, uh, you have to refactor a method that has 1,000 lines. Uh, do you, did you, how many of you have ever seen a method of 1,000 lines? Yeah, I love you guys. What do you do? You have 1,000 lines to refactor. Well, a quick hint, a class should never exceed the 300 lines. What do you do? So you have a function, a function with 1,000 lines. They tell you about this function when, when you get hired. They tell you, you will work in this function at the hiring interview. So you have this hum humongous function. What do you do? You promote it as a class. This is called the extract method object refactor. And I quickly, quickly want to show you what it means. When you have, you have a huge function with lots of local variables and deep nesting, if you try to extract this block as a method, you will need to pass this block a lot of parameters. And at some point, it may even be impossible in case you touch two local variables from the outer scope. So in that case, you could, do, you could create a new class that will have all the local variables will become fields in the other place, the parameters you take via the constructor, and then the rest of the logic you put in an execute. For example, method, given from that point on, you can extract any block from the original code in different methods because the, um, the formerly local variables are now fields in the instance, and it's all, they are readily accessible. You can change to two or three fields, and you don't need to pass seven arguments to that function. So uh, extracting methods becomes possible. However, I want to you to realize something. In the left side, I'm just invoking a function. In the right side, I'm instantiating a class I'm using it, and then I'm throwing it away, all right? For that purpose, the right-hand class is stateful. It has fields which store intermediary computations of the current processing. It is a stateful class, and stateful is bad. It is hard to refactor, hard to understand, hard to work with. So my point to you is that if you write, if you design some new functionality from scratch, don't aim for such a design. This is a tool you should use only when you refactor m monstrous legacy code, right? And the, the use of this pattern in Greenfield should be an exception, well-documented and well-debated. OK, that being said, let's talk about objects or the OOP utopia. How many of you know C? Right, good. Now, a struct, right? type their struct. It was, it was lovely, just a collection of data, nothing more. OK, uh, that's one particularly lovely example of a struct in Java. It is immutable. Ah, cool. It can never change. That's why it's easy to work with. It, it will remain valid. It's safe. It's safe to put in keys uh, as the keys in sets and maps, whatever. It's lovely. The other example you anticipated, probably it's private fields with getters and setters. And I get, I'll repeat myself from the morning. This is not encapsulation. This is nothing to do with OOP. It's actually an anti-pattern 
You do more than just setting the field in the setter. So this is nothing different than having public fields. Take down that sonar, I'm joking. But the idea is, it's nothing different, actually. Now, what is OOP in one slide? You will allow me the arrogance, but the OOP is basically exposed behavior and not data. Exposing, instead of exposing your own internal data, expose methods for your user. Do start engine. This way, in the next version, you can have three states for your engine, for example. And when you really have to tell something to your user to expose some data to him, make sure it is, you expose it in the most appropriate way as possible. So don't tell guests in liters, neither percentage fuel left. Tell him estimated remaining kilometers. If you go this way, in the next version of your car, you can implement it as a hybrid car, right? Just how many kilometers can I go on with my battery? So it's an API which will remain more uh, backwards compatible, let's say, it will remain more stable. So OOP, it's all about hiding the implementation details from the code that uses your API. Whoa. But at work, we don't do OOP, do we? Despite the interview, right? We don't do OOP, and there's a reason for that, because in our enterprise applications, at least in my world, we write procedural code. Why? Because most enterprise applications just translate existing procedures from the real world and implement them in software. And I found it quite straightforward to implement procedures using procedural code. So we are just, we are just writing tons, lots and lots of procedural code in our enterprise applications. Whoa, and then our question is, how do you organize it? How do we keep it simple? Simplicity is the most important principle for any, any large enterprise application. How to keep it simple? How to organize this huge amount of procedural code? To do that, we will distribute this huge procedural code into many classes, but these classes are nothing more con but containers of logic. They are just like namespaces, basically. You have service. In the, the order service is not an object, is not a structure, it's just a way of organizing the, the huge amount of procedural code. So just admit it that you are not doing OOP, you are not, you are not doing uh, structures also. There is another form of class which is basically a container of logic. Then, after all, did they really ask us for nothing, those stupid questions at the interview? Hmm, when, when in your career you, will you ever care of of not breaking your clients, the code that uses a certain class. I usually have this as a question, but now let me tell you. Why will you wake up at night terrified, you know, shivering? What? Why? When will that happen? When you create some, when you dare to create some mini library, some mini framework, some mini reusable code that you dare to publish on your corporate nexus, like mycorp-commons-wine.0. And the wine.0 is my, the problem that wakes me up in the night. Because other applications will rely on my 1.0 version. And the next day, obviously, I will find a bug in my code, and I would want to fix my library, and I will go begging the clients of my jar to migrate to 1.1. But if the migration is more than just changing the version number in the POM XML, then they will just not do it for me, and my bug will go to production. So when you write, whenever you write a mini reusable code, a mini library, always think of how hard it will be for your clients to migrate to the next version, and then it is the place to employ OOP to make sure your API stays stable. There is when you have to employ all those OOP skills that you have. Whew. Now, about formatting and comments. Do you see the sunglasses in this bit of code? This is a code, right? This is code. Do you see the sunglasses? Let me take you a broader overview. Do you see the sunglasses there? Let me help you. Whoa, it's, but you know, you know, it's not matrix at work. It's all about teamwork. You are not Neo. You shouldn't code yourself and prove how geek you are, how obfuscated code you can possibly write. You are working in teams. Despite the faculty or who, that only gave us homeworks for individual works. And so you, after you finish the faculty, you come to work. And suddenly, there is someone standing next to you, you know? And he's alive, he moves if you touch him. 
Oh my God, I have a colleague. What's that a colleague? It's a human being. I have to interact with him? How? You know, this, this, is a major, this is a major problem for any graduate to work in teams, to, to, to support, to stand, to tolerate another human presence. And once you get in a team, the whole world shifts because it's all about caring for the other team member. Otherwise, they will hunt you down. So don't code, this is my message. Never code, never obfuscate. Don't use the, you know, what, what did you do today? I coded. I already see you with the Enigma machine, encrypting a message, you know? Don't do that. Write, communicate in code. Tell your thoughts, express your intention. Respect your reader. The code you wrote in 10 minutes will be, uh, the code you wrote in 10 minutes will be read for almost two hours by someone. And you don't want to know the thoughts in that person's mind about you. So be nice to your readers, be nice to the one who will maintain your code, write literature, write nice phrases, explain what you want to do, and never ever obfuscate. Again, I repeat myself, if you have energy in one day, invest it into optimizing, into simplifying, into making a mini framework for testing. So test is the most challenging activity you can ever do, and no matter how professional, how experienced you are. So invest all your energy into good test. There is also another thing that I always say, there is no reason for pride in any software application besides having fast, super high coverage, significant, non-overlapping, clean, dry tests. There is no other reason to, to, to brag about the software. Now, if you join the army, they will tell you that, look, this is your Karashnikov. From now on, this is your wife, your mother, your... Uh, this was like, like in the movies, right? I will tell you the same about your IDE. It is the bit of software you must dream about. You must know it by heart. Learn those darn shortcuts. Do contests, refactoring contests, in which you put the mouse here, and you, you say, start. Who finishes first gains the beer, you know? So, Learn those shortcuts. Make sure you are as fast as hell when using those shortcuts. Because when you will have to do a major refactoring, you need to move lightning fast. Uh, configure uh, reasonable static imports, reasonable default code blocks. Make sure you have a short, 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 tiny feedback loop. Like Venkat said, in the time you have into building a fast feedback loop, into having instantaneous deploy, instantaneous uh, super many tests and so on. Now, just some suggestion, the line, the line should never go over 120, 140, because otherwise you will force the reader with his mouse to click on the darn scroll bar and to drag the scroll bar. And you don't want to do that to your reader. So never force your reader to scroll horizontally. For method the length I already discussed with you, the point is to be easy to understand never more than one screen. But for the length of the class, I already told you, somewhere about 200, 300 lines more. These are just suggestions. Whether you use tabs or two characters, whether you use Egyptian style or not, whether you use spaces, how you put the brackets, I don't care. All that matters is that the whole team follows the rule that were established by the team. So play with them, make them the code as similar, as, as idiomatic as possible with theirs. Cool, and my favorite slide. Comments are failures. Comments are a written expression of your incompetence. Uh, that's a good one, that's a really good one. Uh, why? Well, I told you, some of us have remorses when they finish writing some code. And what did they do? They drop a comment there and hoping the next one will understand and run away. They just drop a comment because they know they screw it up. What I tell you is don't do that. Take a walk, use the bucket of, of, of clean, cold water next to your, next to your desk. Uh, I mean, clarify a bit the mind, come back and refactor, improve the expressiveness of the code. Why am I so against comments? Because statistically, somewhere about 15, 20% 20, 20 of the good developers always remember to up update the Java doc when they change the implementation of something. So inevitably, the comments will, turn, will end up lying to you, lying to you in the face, telling you a story 10 years ago or five years ago. That's even why, even IntelliJ and Eclipse display the comments in a washed away color, not to disturb your eyes, not to, not, because everybody knows that the only truth is the live running code. All that is a, a, a part of that, it's, 
it's nonsense. It, it will, not the specification, not the Java doc, it all falls out of sync. The only thing that matters is the live code. So what, I tell, what, I, what I ask of you is improve the expressiveness. What the heck is that? I mean, really, the list, the list, the, the one, right? In the array, x, my god, list one. And the best thing is x of zero. This is the ultimate stuff. I mean, x of zero, really, equals four. Really? These are magic numbers that you need to explain to your readers, of course. Then introduce new useless variables, new explanatory variables to name some some bit of computation. For example, is flagged equals cell of status equals flag. You see, this variable, you would laugh at me, but this variable exists for two lines. You, we will be tempted to inline it, to destroy it, but no, leave it like that because it tells something. It tells that this means the, that the cell is flagged. And this also plays well when you have this if, and then you start a Boolean expression, you hit enter, you continue, or, or, and, and, enter, and, 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 you love those, right? And you need to click on the bracket to see where it ends. It's, it's absolutely adorable. So what I do about this, I extract all the brackets as, as, as temporary variable, let's say. I put them names, and I then compose them in one single line. So, um, in a sense, respect your predicates, respect your Boolean tests. If they are that, that complicated, then they deserve more than one creepy line. Introduce new variables to store the intermediary tests. Now, what I did next is I even created a method to, to host. You, 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 will, you may laugh at me again, but I created a method that does just did this bit. For one line for 25 characters, I created a method, name is flat. This is so frequently used that it even has a name. This is called encapsulate conditionals. When you take a Boolean condition and you put it in a method and give it a name. I created this method just to, to be more expressive, what I mean. And even now I even switched to object-oriented stuff. So now if I tell you that this is a bit of code from Minesweeper, you won't be shocked, right? I mean, it's game board, it's cell, it's flag. I know you can write this in one line with, with, with Java 8, but hold on. hold on. This, along with splitting your methods into multiple methods with long expressive names, is the way you want to leave code behind you in a live document to tell the very code to explain the in your intention. Cool. Now, example of bad comments. That's, uh, this one is, is my favorite. You know, uh, besides the fact that the author probably needed a professional, professional counseling from someone in this psychology, I don't know, uh, because uh, this guy expressed his negative feelings in the code. You should never do that. It conveys your negative emotions to your reader. Never do that. How many of you have seen cursing and bad words in code, in the production code? Don't, don't uh, avoid that, because it will make your reader feel like shit, really. So f besides that, what scares me most is, that, is the fact that this might be a forgotten to do. So as a minimum, make sure you put to do whenever you want to continue something. This is, this is Matrix. This is the victory of machine against human. This is Sonar teaching you how to program. Make sure you tune those damn Sonar rules. Hack them, make them work with you, not against you. This is a clear sign of a too long class. Of course, it should be broken up. Commented out code is not there for you to read it. It's not there for you to uncomment it. So, duh. Delete it. If you have any problem with that, the git is still there, okay? okay? Non-local, if you really have to put a comment, put it on the same line, not on a function, not on a class, no. On that line, to be in front of the eyes of the reader. And then, if you really have a lot of energy, don't describe to me what the abstract factory design pattern is in the Java doc of your class. Put a UN wiki. I know you did it yesterday evening, but don't expect Explain it to me in two paragraphs of text, right? So don't be overly, if you have energy, write a test again. Now, there are also examples of good comments. When you just can't say that you want to use Jigstra algorithms for navigating, for traversing an oriented graph, stuff that is too complicated to put it, to express it in code. There are occasions. But then only put the URL of the thing that you wanted, that you followed. It may, it may be a bug workaround. It might be some classic algorithm. Put the URL, it's enough. 
Now, if you really have to pass seven as an argument to a strange API, explain what that seven means, right? Maybe you can put some Java docs there. In case you aren't sure what kind of developer profile will maintain your code, you can leave behind this kind of, I mean, don't put simple date format or as a field in a class, these kind of things. To do's are followed by the name, sometimes even by the date, preparing for the debarkation, I mean delivery day. Um, public Java doc, if you really have to write, to write your own library, make sure, I mean, you need to write more Java doc just to keep the, the client code, the client developers out of re-implementation. You want to explain them as nice as possible what API means uh, to avoid them to go into your implementation. Legal stuff, okay. Now, lightsaber. We love Lambda, right, because they're cool. I mean, they literally caused a dramatic increase in the popularity of Java after they were introduced. The thing about Java 8 is that, uh, is the code cleaner than Java 7? That was my concern. It can be more expressive, but if you abuse it, it can even become very, very, very cryptic. And I have several talks about this, to this topic and what are the best practices for writing clean code using Java 8. I'll now skip this because time is, is running out. Just an example here, yes. You see here, this four dots has line and not in stock is a method in the same class that hosts some bit of, actually a predicate in, the, in essence, but this predicate is specific to the use case implemented in that class. So it's no use in other places, and I put it as a private method in the same class. Then you can see here, order line is not in stock. This is an encapsulate, an encapsulate conditional application, which actually created the Boolean function in the very entity. Then you can even work with predicates as local variables. That's creepy. Uh, but you can even do more. You can have fun higher order functions that return you parameterized predicates. Uh, this is creepy. It's supposed to be creepy. If a predicate takes some parameter, for example, uh, delivery due date before some date, then this predicate cannot be right in the entity on anyone else. You have to have some factory method for the predicate. It's pretty creepy, I know. So the point is you will work with predicates and Respect your predicates, work nicely with them. Java 8, of course, is a new language. It's a new paradigm shift. Latvenka said, actually, it's switching slowly towards a declarative way of programming. And since you're learning not only a new language, but a new paradigm, you need to know it all. Because simple, again, simple is not necessarily what you are familiar with. So you have to learn it first, and then it may prove to you to be more simple. But after you've learned it, don't use lambdas everywhere the, the, the day before. Adopt it progressively, maybe even in six months, maybe in nine months, in order for all the team to be sure that they understand what you're doing there. Then don't ever do arrow bracket. You know why? Because that's an anonymous function. You agree? When you do that, you are about to write an anonymous function. And that's precisely my problem. It's anonymous, doesn't have a name, and I will love names. I love to be told what the function does. So don't do that. Instead, write a method in the same class and reference it from this using four dots and the name of the method. Don't do that as much as possible. Use the map function and the flat map function of the optional. Learn about monads, whatever I told. Uh, then cherish about predicates, uh, work with them, like I showed you in the slide before. And in the end, find the simplest form, ask for review from the other developers. It's essential. Peer review is essential. And the best form of peer review, you know, I had this talk, this discussion over and over. Peer review is equal to peer criticism, to peer arguing, to peer blaming. Don't, it's better yet to have peer programming, to proactively um, Better ways to gather and not have someone criticizing your code, right? So prefer to do pair programming as much as possible. Okay, as the key points, stop refactor equals start legacy. And when you stop refactor, you should put in the calendar and drink to that. Then names, it's all about refining and continuously searching for better names in your code. Functions should be small with long names, expressive names. Classes are of three kinds, structs, which are best if immutable, objects which should hide their data and their things inside, and logic containers if you're writing procedural code, lots of procedural code. For formatting, comments are failures, admit it. 
and prefer always to refactor, to refine your names, to express it in code. With Lambda, since you're learning a new language, a new paradigm, make sure someone pair programs with you daily, perhaps. Cool. These were basically the key points. Now, how to apply this in my own legacy code? I continue, to, I continue to say that over and over. Practice. Practice over and over. Do katas. Do dojos. Do, go to code retreat days. Grow your skills. It's hard. It takes months, maybe years of practice. But in the end, you will love it. OK, books, books. This is the Bible. No developer can ever write any line of code until he has finished at least half of this book. I put it in Jaira. Read the book. Read the film. Anyway. That was it. Thank you all for your attention. I really love being here with you.